Welcome, welcome back to another piano lesson with Warren. If you're new to the channel, my name is Warren McPherson. How are you guys doing this week? I honestly pray and trust that all of you are in the best of health and you're doing well. I know we're living in a very strange times right now where we don't know what thing is going to be like next week, let alone next month. But all we can do is continue to pray, stay steadfast, and do what we do best, which is to create music. So, in today's tutorial, I'm going to share with you some tips, about eight tips as a keyboard player functioning in a band. Is it different than when you're playing solo piano? Absolutely. You know, think about living on your own opposed to living with roommates or living with siblings. The dynamic is different and we have to adjust accordingly when we're playing in a band. And so I've been playing in a band for well over 10 years and I've picked up some things. I've learned some things through trial and error. In today's tutorial, I want to share those tips with you. All right. So don't go anywhere. Stay tuned. And if you haven't hit that subscribe button yet, do so. I'll be right back. So, as you know, most of us learning piano online, we practice in our homes, in our room, and that, that, that's the extent of our musical training. So you might be enrolled in my online program or you just pick up tips and tricks from YouTube videos. Most of it is usually centered around here are, here's what you do to improve your piano playing. Not a lot of that information includes, okay, if you're playing in a band, do I still play the same way? Do I still use chords the same way? Do I still play melodies the same way? And so I decide, you know, I don't think I've ever done a video on that either. So I want to share some tips with you. So let's go down the line. I kind of have a little list here. I jot down some stuff. The first thing Piano players, and this can even apply for non-piano players, but show up to rehearsal on time and be prepared. Might seem like a mundane task. You're like, what? That's not a tip. But over my years of experience, I've come across a lot of keyboard players who show up to rehearsals consistently late. It's not a good look as a piano player. It shows you're not reliable. And a keyboard player who is not reliable don't get called a lot. So show up on time. On time is usually a few minutes before the actual rehearsal starts. And show up prepared. What do I mean by that? You got to know the song. So if you're working on three songs in the rehearsal, don't show up and then try and to have the, key, the, the bass player tell you what chords the songs to the songs or the guitarist or the singer. You got to know these things ahead of time. You got to be prepared. Again, if you want to be a keyboard player that is reliable and get called on a lot, you have to show up prepared. You should be learning the songs before you get to rehearsal. And an extension to that, as a keyboard player, when you're learning a song, playing in a band, you should learn every aspect of that song, not just the chords. You should know what the bass line is. You should know what the singer's melody and harmony is. You got to know the song because oftentimes... <laughs> The keyboard player somehow becomes the default director of the band. Most bands I've played, everybody looked to the keyboard player for directions, especially when it comes to chords and harmony. And so, again, if you want to be seen as a reliable keyboard player that gets called on a lot, it's good to learn the other parts, especially the vocal parts. Um, because some singers might not be singing the correct harmony. It's clashing with the chords. And it's important for the keyboard player to be able to hear that and say, I think this is your harmony note. So preparation, right? Learn as much as you can about the structure of the song from a harmonic and a melodic perspective. Tip number two for keyboard is playing in a band. And this is just something I have sort of developed for myself, I found personally, is to bring extra chord charts to rehearsal. Now, I usually travel with my chord charts. Even if I have the song memorized, it's good to have chord charts. Why? Not everybody's gonna be as prepared. And I've been in bands where the bass player shows up, knows none of the songs, and because I have an extra chord chart, I was able to say, here you go. Rehearsal was able to function on time and efficiently because 
now everybody's on the same place playing the right chords and everything. So it's just good to have extra chord charts, especially if you're playing in a band where you have second keyboard player, guitar players who may be playing chords as well, just to ensure everybody's playing the right chords, help things move along more smoothly. So that's tip number two, bring an extra chord chart. You know, it's just another preparatory step that I think is important that I've discovered in my years of playing with a band. Tip number three is to be prepared to be able to play the song a half step higher or a whole step lower or a half step lower. Half step higher or a half step lower. Now, this is a very important step in my experience because singers send you a bunch of songs and say, these are the songs we're going to be rehearsing. That's the only direction they gave you. And what I've often find, especially in church, you show up to rehearsal, the song's in the key of C sharp, but the sopranos are struggling. They can't hit some of them notes. And the singers are like, can we lower it? But it's funny, singers usually just look to musicians and be like, can we lower it? And they're expecting you to do that instantly. So if you're somewhat intermediate beginner and you're not fluent in all keys, that might be a struggle if you did not learn it in the neighboring keys, half step lower or half step higher. And so as a preparatory step to make sure you're, you're not caught with your pants down, so to speak, just learn the song a half step higher or half step lower. Do not rely on the transpose button. You know, I've talked about this a lot. I'm, I'm very much opposed to transpose button. However, if you're absolutely in need and you gotta hit that transpose button, you gotta do what you gotta do. But it's just, again, I'm, I want you guys to be seeing yourself and treating yourself as professionals. Even if you're not getting paid, you want to present yourself as professionals. And so knowing that song a half step higher in a key or a half step lower just helps you to be prepared. So if the singers be like, oh, it's too low. Can we raise it a half step? You're good. Or ah, it's too high. Can we lower it a half step? Oftentimes, in my experience in church also, singers sometimes might like to take up that second verse a half step. It's just the vibe of like, let's do that second verse a half step. And if you're not capable of doing that, you know, it's going to slow you down. You know, people are going to look at you like, ah, oh, he's not that competent. So that's just a good practice. Tip number three, be prepared to sing, uh, play the song a half step higher or a half step lower. Let's jump to tip number four. The singer is always right. <laughs> it sounds outdated, you know, like they always say, the customer is always right, but the singer is always right. And let's talk a little bit about this. Now, our main job as pianist in a band, we are playing an accompaniment role, a supporting role. The singers are usually the spotlight of the band, the highlight of the band. And so we want to make them look good, right? We want the singers to, be, to look good as much as possible. Sometimes singers like to throw musicians curveball. Some singers who are not that experienced may accidentally raise the key a half step because they're not able to stay in key. And so if you decide that, hey, you just raised the song and we didn't prepare on that, so you're on your own. I'm going to keep playing in the same key. It's going to look disastrous. And who people are going to blame? It's definitely not going to be the singer. In fact, the singer is going to start looking at you like, bro, what you doing? You're not playing in the right key, even though they are the one that accidentally raised the key. You know, sometimes a singer might even skip a verse or skip a section of the verse and jump to the chorus. I've had literally... All of these surprises happened to me more than once in my lifetime. What do you do? You have to jump with them. If the singer change key, you change with them. If the singer decide to do a double chorus without alerting you, you got to be prepared. You have to be flexible and be willing to go where the singer goes. So that's what I mean by the singer is always right. If the singer starts the song slower than you practice, you got to roll with the singer. Our job is to make sure that the music is held together, the music is going right, and the singer looks good, right? Because trust me, if anything goes wrong, it's usually the keyboard's fault, even if it isn't. So it's just a good um, mental preparation to be ready, be vigilant. Things happen. 
even to the best of singers, the best of players, things happen and we have to be flexible and be willing to change. Tip number five, avoid playing the melody unless you're playing a traditional hymn. Now, most singers don't like when keyboard players playing the melody. You're playing the entire melody of the song behind them. That's a little bit annoying because singers like to embellish their melody, especially in the gospel church. Singers want to be able to do their runs wherever they want. And if you're playing the melody behind them, it kind of gets in their way of doing that. So that's a big no-no. You don't play the melody. There might be one or two spots where you might hit a few melodic notes behind a singer. That's fine. That's actually tasteful when you do that. But if you're playing that melody from beginning to end behind a singer, mm -mm 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 -mm. singers do not like that. And honestly, it does not sound good because it's going to be conflicting with the singer. So you avoid playing the melody. So you might be saying, Warren, if I'm not playing the melody, what am I playing? You're playing chords mixed in with what we call licks. So you're playing improvisatory stuff during the rest spots. Let's take the simple song, Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found with my light. But now I see. So you see, just as a rough example, how I was sort of answering to those melodic lines that a singer would sing. During those rest periods, I would do a little fill, I would do a little lick, little run, little melodic things. That's what the role of a keyboard player is. Complimenting the singer with those melodic lines, treating it like a conversation. Call and response. You don't sit there and play the melody behind a singer, right? So that's the important thing. Now, when I say traditional hymn, if you're playing a hymn from the hymn book, traditional sort of, you know, classical style, that's acceptable to play the melody because it's expected. Usually in those cases, the congregation or the singer is keeping things as written in the hymnal, melodic line the same. So it is tradition that you'd play the melody, even though you don't have to. But that's the only case I can think of where a keyboardist play the melody from beginning to end and gets away with it. <laughs> in other cases, don't do that unless you're doing an instrumental, right? Tip number uh, six, and this is another big one, avoid playing too low in the bass register. You want to get a bass player ticked off, play in his register too long, bass players don't like that, and rightfully so. That's their domain. The bass register. Now, what do I consider the bass register? I like to say anything below this F, sometimes below the C right here, that's bass territory. Now, that doesn't mean you have to avoid that entire section of your keyboard completely. No. I go down there from time to time when I'm playing with a bass player. But you have to do it tastefully. There are certain places that you might want to double up the bass with the bass player for just a few notes or a few lines. Bass player actually will appreciate that stuff because, again, the bass player is a part of the band. And in a band setting, you're treating it like a communal conversation. And so you can have some conversation with the bass player by, you know, complimenting stuff he does. But just like the singer and the melody, you don't want to be playing that bass line behind the bassist entirely. No, that's a no-no. It sounds weird, and it will definitely get the bass player ticked off. So this is where this whole notion of rootless voicing comes in. Because we have that consistent bass going, that frees us up as pianists to not even have to play the root of the chord, which gives the chords that we're playing a unique flavor when we omit that root. It actually opens us up as piano player to do a lot more when we have that bass going with rootless voicing chords. Now, I know the rootless voicing concept is more an advanced concept, but 
just want you to explain that's where it comes from. When you have a bass player, you can pretty much ignore the root of the chords because the bass got that covered. And in an experienced band where you have an experienced bassist, an experienced keyboard player, you're just going to hear how beautiful it sounds when that conversation gets going between the keyboard player and the bass player. All right? Tip number seven, communicate with the second keyboard player and or the guitarist of the band. Now, a lot of bands um, have a second keyboard player. So you see two guys up there playing keyboards, and oftentimes they're a guitarist. There could be even two guitarists in bigger bands. You have to be communicating. And by communicating, I'm talking about visually. You guys need to be making eye contact on a regular to ensure that you're communicating. Some bands may have what we call talkback mics, where they have mics where only people in the band can hear persons talking through those mics. And oftentimes, you need to do that to ensure we're on the same page, especially in churches where things were a little bit more fluid, where the singer might decide they're going to do an extended verse or a double chorus, or they're going to do a spontaneous songs. Now, the important reason why you need to communicate with these players is because these are other harmonic players in the band. An organist is also considered a second keyboard player. In some cases, a lot of the times, an organist just, you know, keeping stiff stuff groovy in that background. But they're also part of the harmonic structure of the band, which means a lot of the times you guys are sort of occupying the same register. And so you want to make, you can't just spontaneously decide you're going to reharm an entire section of the song, playing all kinds of chords that the other keyboard player or the organist or the guitarist don't know what you're doing. It's like having a conversation with somebody and all of a sudden, you switch the conversation, you're talking about something totally different that they don't know what you're talking about. It's going to cause confusion. And so if you might decide, you know, I'm going to reharm this section of the song, that would be a good place if you have a talk about Mike to say, let's do this chord instead of that chord. You know, or, hey, let's go to the six. Or let's play a flat nine here, depending on how close sometimes you might be able to shout that out. But you have to communicate. You also have to communicate non-verbally, meaning... If the guitarist is doing a nice improvised solo or, or line, you can't then decide you're going to start doing a solo and improvised line as well. That's like talking over somebody while they're talking. That was considered a no-no in a conversation. It's also considered rude in a band. And so you leave room for when a player is doing their thing. You make sure to stay out of their register, right? If the organist is up here doing some screaming things, he got all his draw bars out, that's the organist shining. You back off of that register. And so there's a sort of un, unwritten communication that needs to happen. And you do that through listening. If a player is occupying a certain register at a certain point of the song, you may probably want to avoid that register. And this dynamic is a fluid dynamic. You know, you just listen to what's happening and you move through different registers based on what's happening in the song. This is going to be different for every band, every song, every section of the song. Like I say, it's a conversation, and you have to listen so you know when it's your turn to speak. And so communicate with the other harmonic players of the band, right? Tip number eight is to pay attention to the overall tempo and volume of the song in the absence of a music director. Now, again, in my experience, I think it's safe to say eight times out of ten, the keyboard players are usually the ones who are the unofficial directors of the band. Everybody sort of like to look to the keyboard players, especially if it's a keyboard, an experienced keyboard player. The band needs somebody in charge, right? If you don't have a director, somebody needs to step up. You know, I'm a little biased, so I'm going to say the keyboard player needs to step up and be that director of the band. If you're new to this role, you might not know what to do, but it's, it needs to have somebody in the band that sort of makes certain decisions, especially as it relates to tempo. Some drummers are not the best at keeping time, and so their tempo might start to speed up a little bit. It's important for the keyboard player to be able to feel that and go, the song's getting faster. Look over to the drummer, and, you know, you can say, 
back off the tempo a little bit, you know. You can develop your own little rules, your own little hand signals. So a player needs, need, um, knows what what means. One of the, the, the key thing I usually listen for to tell if the tempo is right or the tempo is too fast is just listen to the singers. Are the singers sound like they're out of breath? Are they chopping their words short because they're not able to fully pronounce the words? Those are big indicators that the song's too fast. And it's very hard to pull back a drummer if he's not aware. And so you got to make him aware. Again, eye contact communication, too fast, back off. As the drummer slows down, it's easy for the rest of the band to follow. But you as a keyboard player can't single-handedly slow down a drummer without sounding like you're playing out of time. So communication is key, right? Bass players, sometimes you might need to communicate with them. Again, on the harmonic structure, if you're going to do a wild chord that you guys didn't rehearse, but you know it would work, you're probably going to want to have bass man on that because we know the bass carries the root of the chord. And so if the, the bass is playing something else and you're doing something else, it's going to sound completely wrong because the bass needs to have the foundation of whatever harmonic shift you're happening. Another big thing, especially in churches, is the volume. Volume is excessively loud. And we need to have somebody in the band that can hear that things are too loud. We need to back off. My indication is generally, can I hear the singer? If I can't hear the singer, we're too loud, right? And I know not every church is structured the same way, but if you have monitors and you can't hear the singer through the monitor, something is wrong. Either the band is too loud, the monitor is off, sound guy not doing his job. But in either case, if you're not hearing the singer, then it's easy for people to start speeding up the song, the singers and the band be out of sync. So again, we need to, to default to somebody as the director, the unofficial director. If the keyboardist really doesn't feel like he's capable of taking on that role, find someone in the band that you know has the musical experience to say, you be the guy that tells us if we're too fast, too loud, you know, we can do hand signals because if not, it's going to be chaos, everybody doing their own thing, right? So those are just some unwritten rules based on my experience over the years playing with a band that I think are crucial for keyboard players to develop from now because these are not things that you can develop on your own just playing, practicing in your room. These skills are developed through constant interaction and playing in a band setting. And these eight things I've found to be super crucial because I've met players who've been playing for years and still haven't developed these skills, um, especially when it comes to like showing up to rehearsal on time or communicating with other members of the band to make sure you're not occupying their register because the keyboard is a very wide instrument in terms of range. We can go as low as any bass player. We can go as high as any other instrument in the band. It's very easy to start to crowd up the song. The keyboard is also a rhythmic instrument, you know? A lot of the times in bands, the guitarist likes to play the rhythmic role, playing riffs and licks and little stuff to help keep that little groove going. And so we gotta make sure that we're not overshadowing the, the guitarist by trying to be too busy. We're not overshadowing the basses by trying to play all the bass notes. And we're not overshadowing the second keyboard player by trying to cover everything he's doing. A lot of the times, the role of a second keyboard player is to create depth through the use of other sounds, strings, pads, or melodic lines through synths and stuff. And so we have to be conscious to make sure that we're communicating and we're staying out of each other's way. We're giving each other the opportunity to voice their instruments. So I trust this was enlightening and helpful for you. If you have been known to violate these eight rules, I would say start to think cleanly and clearly about not violating them because these eight rules will help to make or break your uh, sort of path as becoming a reliable and accepted pianist in your society. People like to work with people who are reliable knows how to communicate, show up, prepare, and all of that. And whether or not you want to be a pro musician, these skills are important if you ever want to be able to play 
in a band, in your church, in your community. Good skills to develop. All right. And obviously, if you're struggling with your piano playing, just being able to learn songs, learn chords, learn the theory, learn the ear training, to have a structure to be a better piano player, I really do encourage you to head over to PianoListenWithWarren.com and check out my piano program over there. I run a wonderful community for gospel musicians and gospel musicians only. Meaning, we only focus on gospel songs. The information you learn over there can be applied to any genres of song, regardless if you're interested in gospel music or not. But just know, in that community, it's heavily focused towards gospel music and training gospel musicians. And so if you fit the bill and you think you could benefit from some instructions, some directions to help take your playing from A to Z, I guarantee there will not be a better online place for you to hang out. Right now, we're currently running a seven day trial for $1. So you can sign up for $1, sign up for seven days for a dollar, and you can check out the program. You get access to all the videos, all the downloadable files, everything. After seven days, if you're, if it's not for you, you can cancel, no commitment, no questions asked, no problem. But I believe we run one of the best online piano program for gospel musicians, and I want you to get a chance to check it out to see if it's right for you. Because if it's not right for you, we don't want you in the program. But if it's right for you, I guarantee You'll be super happy to see the progress you'll be able to make in just a matter of weeks. All right. So until then, keep listening, keep singing and keep practicing. Remember to hit the subscribe button. Give a thumbs up if you're new to the channel. And hey, I would love to hear from you in the comment section. What are some other important things you think keyboard players need to keep in mind as they play in a band? Until then, see you next week. All right. Bye for now.